Okay, welcome everybody. This is the All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church Community Forum. I'm Joe Robertson, a member of All Souls and also a committee member of this forum, which for decades has carried on important conversations with some of our community's most innovative thinkers and change makers. Today we have Mary Lindsay, board member of the League of Women Voters of Kansas City and Jackson Clay and Platte Counties. Mary is the chair of the redistricting committee of the League of Women Voters in Kansas City and a member of the organization statewide redistricting committee. You, so, you know, they've been busy and, and Mary's gonna tell us why. Mary, welcome back to the forum. Thank you, thank you, Joe. I'm, I am totally delighted to be here and hello to everybody. Um, this is great. Uh, and I have seen some familiar faces and names and uh, some not familiar to me, which is also nice. Um, my only regret is that, you know, we have to do this on Zoom, but I understand it, of course, and I'm not complaining, but it's, it's much harder to speak um, to a group when you can't see them. And so, you know, I, I will, muddle through as best I can. I, um, I want to thank Theo Schubert, who got me scheduled in to do this, and, and Joe and Renee, who have been very supportive, um, especially with the technical challenges that, um, that I have. Um, anyway, so with that, I... Um, I'm ready to share my PowerPoint screen and get rolling in that way. Okay, redistricting, the most influential yet overlooked undertaking in Missouri politics. And I think that's true in every state. Um, certainly it is true here in our part of Missouri. Um, I am with the League of Women Voters, as Joe said, um, it's a nonpartisan political organization. We never endorse candidates, but we do take a position on some issues. Uh, the League encourages informed and active participation in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy, which I guess is the reason I'm here now. Um, with respect to redistricting, the position of the League is that um, we promote fair and effective rep representation at all levels of government. And we want to maximize transparency and the opportunity for public participation. And of course, we reject gerrymandering. We also like to keep in mind that 10 years is a long time. And when, when redistricting is in place, the new districts last for 10 years. So, um, that's one of the reasons it's so important. Um, everything starts with the constitution, which required from the beginning, um, a census every decade um, to enumerate people. It was different at the very beginning of the country, but for a, quite some time, it's been all the residents. Um, and one of the jobs of redistricting is, um, I mean, of the census, is um, to be able to reapportion the, um, the districts for the 435 congress congressional seats that we have. Um, hmm. It wasn't advancing like it normally does, but okay, it, it has now. Um, this is the current map of the, with the new census material. And um, the purple states are ones that lost one district and the light greens gained one district and Texas gained two districts in this, this most recent um, re um, census. And hmm, I don't know quite how to, I'll just keep moving this thing around, I guess. Um, anyway, equal population should mean equal representation. That is just very essential. And okay, 
Um, I'll just be quiet and let you all read this. It's not really a, you know, knee slapper, but. Or go ahead and read it, Mary, because some people might be hearing this on radio later. Oh, okay. Um, there's a, a, a guy in, you can see um, Benjamin Franklin behind him. So from the beginning of the country, who says voters should select their own elected representatives. And then there's a more modern guy who says elected, elected representatives should select their own voters. And that leads us right into the topic of gerrymandering, uh, which actually is also called gerrymandering, but I'm, I've known it too long as gerrymandering, so I can't change. Um, and it is a manipulation of electoral lines to benefit one political party. It's very bad because it distorts the votes of the population, it increases the number of safe seats, and consequently, representatives in safe seats aren't accountable to their constituents because all they have to do is worry about the primary. They don't have to worry about the general election. And uh, gerrymandering contributes to polarization and extreme positions because people are having to please their, their base. So, you know, Republicans go further to the right and Democrats um, have to sometimes go further to the left. Um, it also fuels voter cynicism and results in poor voter turnout. And I want to make this point at every opportunity that gerrymandering really is done by both parties. And you'll get more about that later. Um, there are basically two tactics that are used in gerrymandering nowadays. One is packing, and that is where the party in power uh, puts the opposing party's voters in a single district. Um, and if we have time, uh, there's certainly one district in the state that uh, you know, we can talk about in terms of that. And cracking is when, um, is when an area with concentrated with um, the opposing party of the one in power gets just divided. And I will demonstrate that um, in through this. North Carolina is a purple state. And in 16, um, North Carolinians elected a Republican president and a Democratic governor. And here is the state where every county is shown. And there's a dot that represents whether it went red or blue. And the size of the dot um, denotes the margin. So a bigger margin is a bigger dot. And right here is Raleigh and right here is Durham. And I'm gonna show you them in some detail. Right here again, now this is looking at every precinct, not just the counties. So this is Raleigh, this is Durham. And you can see the bizarre lines here that pick up all basically of Raleigh and part of Durham but then not all of Durham. This is an example of packing. This is a different, and right here we have them again. Here's Raleigh and here's Durham and here's this funny shaped um, district. But what they did with the rest of Durham was to make this great big district where they shopped around to find all the um, Democratic voters that they could to put them in this district. Then here is an example of cracking. Um, the city of Greensboro was cracked. And right here, you see this line, that, that's Greensboro. And they cracked it. So half of it went with this um, reddish area. And, and the other half went with this very red area. And now you'll see the result. Um, Basically, you can see them right here in the smaller picture. This great big one was the one and the other is right here from Raleigh and, and Durham. Uh, Charlotte is the biggest city in the state and it was very um, blue and they didn't even apparently try to mess with it. But here is the real take home on it. 
in the congressional election that year in 16, Republicans got 53% of the vote and Democrats got 46 and a half. But you would never guess it from the way this turned out. Republicans got 10 seats and Democrats got three seats. Well, something like this is bound to go to court and it ultimately got to the US Supreme Court. Um, and, but it was paired together with a case that had Maryland. And Maryland um, is the other most gerrymandered state in the country, at least congressional districts. Um, but it's, it's, it's democratic. So, you know, North Carolina, the Republicans were doing it, Maryland, the Democrats were doing it. And here's what happened, it was 5-4 decision. Uh, Rita, Rita Gins, Bader Ginsburg was still on the court. Um, and the ruling was that gerrymandering cases are off limits in federal courts, um, basically because they were, their position is that because gerrymandering is political, it is not a judicial issue. However, they allowed it to be dealt with in state courts and by Congress. So those options are there. So this was June of 19 and you blink your eyes and North Carolina had it in their state Supreme Court. And uh, in that case, it was just three months later and that court invalidated the really, we saw disgusting boundaries of the North Carolina congressional district map. And they required that a new map be drawn within two weeks. So then in the next election in 2020, it clearly was a more representative vote result because they got eight Republicans and five Democrats, which is much closer and maybe right on target. Well, actually, if not, if it was, I, won't, I don't know. It's better than the 10 Republicans and three Democrats that happened there. However, Maryland didn't turn up in their state courts with a gerrymandering case. And so during the whole decade of 2011, they had seven Democrats and one Republican on their eight seats. And then again in 2020, and that was despite the fact that the percentages on it were that the Democrats got 65% and the Republicans 35% of the vote. And a more representative result would have been five Democrats and three Republicans. So, you know, it, it was a problem, but of course, all that is gonna change this year and we'll have to wait and see what happens. I love this cartoon um, because it goes with that Supreme Court decision. Democracy here is this beat up kid. And he says, the Supreme Court decided I'd be better off at home with my parents. And the parents of course are the state legislatures and they've got these, um, uh, what would you call that, paddles, uh, called gerrymandering. So, yeah, that was, I, I love the cartoon. But now we're moving on to talk about um, the legislative redistricting in Missouri this year. Um, this is the current maps that we have yet unchanged. We have 34 Senate seats and we have 163 uh, House seats. And now this is when I'm gonna talk a little bit about clean Missouri, not in great detail, but just about the fact that the criteria used in clean Missouri for um, doing this same um, redistricting, meaning of the, the legislative chambers, um, you know, they have to go with equal population and no voter right abridgments. But their first um, priority after that was partisan fairness and then competitiveness. And they um, sought to have no, well, a 1%, close to a 1% wasted vote count. And 
if I don't know if people know what that means, but we can talk about that in Q and A. Um, but then it changed. We all know um, Amendment Three passed, and that, that's a whole story unto itself about how that happened. Um, and they, of course, had to start out with the same required things. But then they put partisan fairness and competitiveness at the very lowest end of priorities. And the rest is pretty much the same as what's over here. But they have a rule that the wasted votes must be under 15. Well, 14 is really quite gerrymandered. So it, it, that's the position that they have us in this year as redistricting is starting and, and you can't see what I've got there and it doesn't matter much, but I just have a little arrow that says the law, that this is what we're living with is, um, I shouldn't have done that there. Um, okay. So here is the process. We have again the 34 states, this many residents um, per district is what we need. And with the house, we have this. I won't say the numbers because it takes too long. Um, but then the process is that each cham chamber has a redistricting commission comprising 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats who were nominated by their party committees and appointed by the governor. That happened July 9th, yeah. Um, and so it ends up a bipartisan in the sense that it's 10 R's and 10 D's. But um, in order to get a map approved to move ahead, it has to have 14 of 20 commissioners approve of the map. And you know, in any time, that would be hard to accomplish, but these are as outrageously polarized times in our country and our state. And um, so if that doesn't happen, and it probably won't, probably with either of them, if it doesn't, uh, then um, if they fail to agree on a, a plan, then the Supreme Court of the state will appoint a panel of six appellate judges to draw the map. And that will be just requiring a simple majority of the judges. The timeline, we already have the commissions since July 9th. They had their first meeting on August 10th when they had a heck of a time being able to um, elect officers because of the 10-10 thing in the house because everybody was there. Not everybody was present. So they had an uneven number in the Senate side. And so um, they more easily got their decisions made with um, that, with uh, electing officers. Um, but if it goes to, if the commissions fail either or both to get that 70% agreement, then when it goes to the panel of judges, it has to decide within 50 days, it has to be accomplished, which could be a tight squeeze if they go all the way um, to this December 9, um, because March 29th is the last day of the um, people to file for running for Congress. So, but, but it probably won't be a problem. I mean, because surely they will see they can't do it and they will turn it over to the judges. But this is what has been decided at this point. The Senate commission has um, a, you know, agreed on the date and city for uh, three public hearings. And by the way, Amendment 3 does require three public hearings. And that's when those will be for the Senate. The House um, went ahead and came up with three more um, to get them spread out around the state more. And um, both of these are and for Kansas City are gonna be on Tuesday, October 19th. We don't know the venue, we don't know the times, we don't know how, if it's gonna be one hour of a hearing, all day of a hearing, we don't know anything like that. And I just heard yesterday, and I don't know if this is solid as a rock, but I know there's talk in the commissions 
um, of not requiring all 20 of them to go to all these cities, that having eight people go is enough as long as there's four Democrats and four Republicans. So that's on the list of got to wait and see. Okay, well, what can we do to affect the House and Senate redistricting? We can insist that um, both of the processes are fair and transparent. We can testify at the public hearing that will happen in uh, Kansas City, um, actually in both of them, because there'll be one for each chamber. And, and even if people, if some people don't want to give testimony, going is a good thing because Again, we don't know the venue, it may be huge, it may be a, you know, a broom closet, but it would be good if we really filled it up and maybe even overfilled it so the press would notice this and it would become, it would make um, redistricting more in the public eye, more that it's going on and people might learn more about how important it is. Other, another thing we can educate our friends and family about the importance of partisan fairness in redistricting. Um, and um, we also can attend events to build awareness and support for, you know, fair and transparent redistricting. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, well, we'll go, well, probably not, but I'll tell you why later. And we can also share factual information um, on social media. Um, I put this in. Um, this is from the Brennan Center for Justice, which is a fantastic organization regarding all kinds of things about voting and elections. And um, this one you can see, six tips for making effective comments at redistricting hearings. And, um, and it is very good. And if it will help people want to do it, thank you, know, it'll give them a little shot in the arm, um, please do it. Um, okay, now this cartoon is people in an art gallery looking at a big wild um, um, picture that is of nothing, just a mess. And the man says, must have been inspiration for drawing the congressional districts. So that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going congressional. Um, we, as I said, have kept our eight districts and these are where they currently are. Um, the one that I believe is packed is this one right here, St. Louis City. Um, and in the new, well, the, this was our old population 10 years ago in that census and 6,154,000, almost 55,000 is our current census in Missouri. And that makes the ideal population count um, per district 700 and let's, I'm going to call it 770,000. Although actually they're very fussy, meaning the federal government as yeah, the courts are about having it be uh, within 1% of the actual ideal number. And the other rules have to do with um, federal rules that there cannot be um, abridgment of uh, the vote on race, color, or language minority. In this process, it's totally different um, than the last one. Um, because in this one, okay, well, I'm, I'll just show you first who we have, who the players are in this. Here's the Senate Select Committee on Congressional Redistricting. You can see there's a great disparity in the people who populate it, but that is based on the composition of the Senate. It's overwhelmingly Republican. Um, and, oh, and back to them, I don't know that they have done anything. They may have had some quiet meetings, they've not had any hearings, nothing um, that the state committee on redistricting I'm on knows anything about. But the uh, Missouri House Redistricting Committee in April had um, redistricting uh, public hearings uh, one at a time on each of those eight districts. 
where we could give in-person testimony or we could give electronic testimony and that's what I did. Um, and um, yeah, they did that, but we know nothing about any more of that kind of thing happening. This one too is, you know, eight Republicans and three Democrats, again, because that is the composition of um, the House. But here is the plan. Here is the process that has to happen. Um, the Missouri House is the one that will introduce a bill with the map. And that's probably the reason they were the ones who actually already had hearings in May. Um, that will, it will be the House members, I assume from that committee, will draw the map, um, the congressional map, using Maptitude software with the assistance of nonpartisan House staff and GSI, an analyst on GSI, I had to look that up, and I don't know what it really means, but sounds very high tech, and a legislative research assistant. And then it will proceed through the General Assembly, just like any other bill. Um, it must be passed by both houses with a, um, you know, just a, um, a basic majority, not a super majority at all. And, uh, and the, the um, Senate can require amendments to it. We don't know. We don't know how that will play. But then it must be signed by the governor by March 28th because the filing deadline for congressional seats is March 29th. Um, and okay, this is the map of the country showing all of the states that have government trifectas. And a, a trifecta is when both chambers of the legislature and their governorship are held by the same party. And you can see there are quite a few red ones. There are a number of blue ones, and there's also a number that are um, mixed, not trifectas. Um, however, Missouri is a super trifecta since one party holds a super majority in both chambers plus the governor's mansion. Very special. I want to, you know, just make the point here that any party with great political power has a great temptation to gerrymander. I mean, I talked about Maryland and North Carolina and all of these brightly colored states here, you know, probably dealing with what they're going to do in terms of their redistricting, although not all of them have as, you know, totally done by the, the legislature kind of um, processes. Some of them have uh, independent commissions and that, you know, they're really independent, um, different than the, what we have. Um, I'm assuming that ours will go relatively quickly because of having this um, trifecta. And, you know, if they have a lot of discord, it's probably going to be over, shall we keep with two districts that we let the Democrats have? Shall we just go with one? Potentially, they, they have enough power and, and they could do it so that, they, that they're all eight Republican uh, safe districts. But I doubt they will do that because, I mean, what do I know about politics? But it seems like if, it, if they did it, it would be um, risky for their standing, at least among the, the media. Okay, then could technology help save democracy with all those trifecta states? For some time, computer programs have aided gerrymandering. But now there is, there's new user-friendly software that allows even non-techy people to map their community of interest. And I'll talk more about what that is. Also, there's new software that can 
quickly measure the degree of partisan fairness or unfairness in, in an actual or in a proposed district map. So, you know, technology really can do that. Community, communities of interest, I'm going to refer to them as COIs, are groups of people who share a common bond linked to a set of public policy issues. The league was very involved this year in helping hundreds, and, and certainly not just us, um, but lots of communities come together and form um, COI maps. Um, there, there have been a, a number of um, nonpartisan organizations who have really worked on this. Some of the kinds of ties can be cultural and historic, uh, can be broad economic similarities, like all agriculture or all tourist oriented, those kinds of things, or economic interdependencies, um, like all in one labor market, um, as in a metro area. And I am happy to say that Missourians have created about 700 of these community of interest maps, the most, it's, it's reputed to be the most of any state in the union. Uh, so, so we're ready. Oh, now this I have in here because, you know, I had the thing about the second kind of fantastic new um, software that can do the evaluation of redistricting uh, plans. And in this case, it was Dave's redistricting app, which I had not previously heard of till this newspaper article. Um, but it's a state of the art software system used to quickly evaluate, in this case, a new map in Ohio. And they, they deemed it, they panned it. Um, an insult to democracy, Ohio Republicans redistricting plan panned. It was panned soon after release. So this can happen really fast. Okay, redistricting resources that I want everybody to have. Um, first of all, where you can directly from the state of Missouri get information about what's up with the legislative redistricting. Um, and it starts OA because it's in the Office of Administration. And you, what I would do, I'd wait till I, the person had put everything up and then I would do a screen share so you can just have the information on your computer and not have to write any of it. But um, I haven't known how to do that forever. Another is plan score. And it is one of them that um, looks at um, I don't think it's used to create districts, but it definitely does the evaluation of districts after the fact. Another fantastic um, resource is the Brennan Center. And, you know, I gave you the six um, hints on that before. I didn't give them, but I showed you the, um, that it exists. And then the League of Women Voters of Missouri, um, we are striving to keep it up to date with especially what's happening, you know, officially in the state. Okay, I want to move this because I think I will have things going down low. Um, okay, now thinking of both both legislative and congressional redistricting and actions you can take. Again, we can demand fair and transparent redistricting processes, all of them. We can talk to friends and family, letting them know that this is important. We can write letters to the, to the editors of newspapers um, and our state committee, we are working on um, creating a primer on how to do that. Uh, information that's good to have in them and also tips on making it more likely for your letter to be um, published. And I'm actually surprised to say I had two letters over the summer published in the Kansas City Star. Also, there's call-in um, 
radio talk shows, and you can use the same information that you would from um, the suggestions on letter writing. And testifying. Uh, we know that we're going to have an opportunity right in Kansas City to testify on both of those commissions. And we don't know if there will be more um, committee hearings for the legislative redistricting. And again, demonst you know, attend demonstrations and anything that's going on to get the word out about this being a big deal. Another thing I personally love is the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. They do many things, but one of the things that I love is every Monday from 10 to 11, they have a Zoom that is led by uh, Denise Lieberman, who is this attorney dynamo, who is so, I mean, she's not like me. I mean, you really get pumped when you're having an hour of her and she's extremely knowledgeable. And you also um, get, if you do this, if you text MOVPC to 66866, you can get on it and you can get off of it as easily if you decided that you wanted to. Um, and, uh, but you get like one, sometimes two emails a week, especially when the uh, General Assembly is in session. And, and I love that. Um, the thing of, um, of social media, this is if you wanted to uh, follow or let's see, we'd be friending Facebook and following on Twitter. That's exactly how you would do it. Um, I won't read it. I, I put my email in here in case, in case anybody learns anything, they think I really would want to know about redistricting and might not know, and I might not. Um, but also, I do have a PDF of the actual census material for the whole state of Missouri. And I couldn't figure out, I mean, I, I have a few slides that I could look at if people wanted to in the Q&A, but uh, that show some things in our area of the state. Um, but I would be happy to share this PDF with anybody who is interested in it. And okay, here is just some, uh, you know, random things um, on the congressional side. Um, it's not likely, again, because of being a trifecta, a super trifecta of one party holding power in the state, not likely they would have a lot of discord, but they could over how aggressive they wanted to be, how generous they wanted to be, however you want to put it, um, because that's the nature of it just being a bill that they can just pass. Um, oh, a question that I had on here not long ago was, will we have a special session um, for doing the congressional redistricting? And a few weeks ago, we learned from the governor that no, it's gonna be in the regular session, so it won't start until January. Um, we may or may not have, they may or may not have more hearings or accept public testimony. Uh, although I don't think I said it when we were there. You know, the thing about community of interest maps, they are being compiled and they are going to be all um, given to the commissions so that if and when they fail to um, create maps themselves, that, and it has to go to the um, panel of judges, then they will have all that information plus all the testimony that anybody gives. Um, okay, we don't know about how much transparency there's going to be on any of this. And we don't know if they're going to be lawsuits, but these are big, big questions. And there is the one person, one vote thing that, you know, time is up. And if people wanted to ask about that, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but this is my end. The kid with a mess on the wall says to his mom, look again, this is a portrait of our congressional district. So there you have it. And now I will pass it off to Joe and I will stop screen sharing.
Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks, Mary. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, so next we're going to be, get ready to turn it over here to our audience to ask questions um, of Mary. But first, uh, we're going to take a quick break to tell you how you can make a contribution to support this program. Uh, that information, as you will see, is in the, uh, in the chat of how you can do that, how you can make a check out or make a contribution. Also, you'll, you'll note that Renee has also put some of the links that uh, Mary was listing. They're, they're also in the chat. And also now I'll make a quick pitch here for next week's forum that if you, you tune again, tune in again by Zoom and you hear our guest, George Gostello. He's the president and CEO of Union Station. And he will be talking about their powerful exhibit in Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. And so, yes, today you, we have Mary Lindsay of the League of Women Voters unpacking the drama of redistricting in Missouri. To ask questions, you raise your hand Zoom style and you do that by placing your cursor over the reactions icons or, uh, and tap, or tap it at the bottom of the screen, you will select the option to raise your hand. We do ask that if you want to ask a question that you enter your name with your picture and you'll be lined up in our queue in order and we'll call your name. And of course, remember to unmute your microphone or, and remember to ask your question and limit or resist statements and commentary. So, but first, while you're contemplating a question or and or donation, we have, a, I believe, a fun uh, musical interlude for you now. Oh, they drew the district boundaries in a manner so obscene. People gathered signatures to make Missouri clean. We cast a million votes with fair elections as our dream. People power makes us strong. When people power pulls together to create a better world forever, gerrymandered boundaries will sever. People power makes us strong. Jeff City politicians said, oh no, this shall not be. They created a chicanery they call Amendment 3 to negate election ballots of a strong majority. People power makes us strong. People power pulls together to create a better world forever. Gerrymandered boundaries will say. Power we are fighting to protect democracy from redistricting shenanigans, unfair skullduggery. Fair and free elections will depend on you and me. People power makes us strong. When people power pulls together to create a better world forever, gerrymandered boundaries will say. The, the, the works by uh, performed by Shannon Jones, uh, the lyrics by Bill Claus, uh, very familiar to most of the people on this uh, on this call. And this, uh, yeah, Shannon Jones of All Souls and KKFI, Bill Claus did that. All right, so I think uh, we're ready to get to go with some questions. And uh, uh, Richard, you're up. Uh, yeah, so are you concerned with... Um, <clears throat> the changes on the Supreme Court and the court system in general since 2016, that uh, the ruling you're referring to with North Carolina and other similar rulings might be uh, overturned? Oh, no, I'm not concerned that it would be overturned because um, that ruling um, in 19 wasn't really a well, I mean, it was favorable in the sense that um, they said that 
while it wasn't in the province of the um, Supreme, well, the federal courts, that it could be in state courts and that Congress could do something about it. I mean, it'd be much worse if they said, it is what it is and nobody can do anything about it. And yeah, so I'm, I'm I mean, it, it already was a pretty bad ruling, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, uh, Evelyn. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, a, um, I'm Evelyn Maddox. I'm a colleague of Mary's in the League of Women Voters. And thank you, Mary, uh, for the presentation. I want to uh, tell our All Souls members that Mary was on the forefront of Missouri's, the League's, Missouri League's participation in developing fair maps. Mary, I think we need to tell them that the drive for fair maps by the League of Women Voters started two years ago. So on a national level, all of our 400,000 plus members for two years have been encouraged to, um, to participate in the monitoring of redistricting as it's occurring uh, after the census. So uh, Mary is special to us at All Souls and special to the League, uh, but she is one of many people working in every state in the union to educate the public about the need to, um, I'm going to say, monitor redistricting, you know, by communicating to their map developers the need for transparency and for fair maps. So uh, th thank you, Mary, for all you've done. And all souls should be proud of you. <laughs> oh, well, um, thank you. And I love all souls. And I'm always proud of of all souls and and you just um, stepped down from being state president of the league for two years yes yes and uh, you did a fantastic job with that thank you so Mary, I got if I could uh, drop in a question uh, here and again everybody who if you have questions again just go down reactions raise your hand if it's not working you can also tune your camera on, camera on wave because if, if you can't figure that out uh, don't uh, but the the um, if somebody people who are politically active you know, are partisan Democrats and Republicans if you know that Republicans are going to be always doing everything. Well, I know I want to, this goes both ways. Republicans do everything they can when they have the opportunity. Democrats do everything they can when they have the opportunity. So should, uh, if somebody is really trying to look after their interests, whatever, whatever their party is, should they be looking to try to find this, you know, completely ethical way to do it? Or should you be, should people be advocates and take opportunities to pull the tug, the tug of war in their direction when they get the chance? Well, <laughs> I truly have no power, but I do have an opinion. And, and my opinion really is, um, you know, to do the right thing and to, to do any kind of gerrymandering really is um, a way of, of almost stealing votes because people, you know, it isn't a fair representation of what a population really uh, once based on how they vote it is it it's really distorted and so I think I think it's wrong to um, I mean you know do you think even if it's not against the law it's wrong to um, cheat on um, plagiarizing you know something that you write or you know things that you might never get caught on um, and but you know, but isn't is it a right or a wrong thing? And and I really do think of it, and and maybe part of that is because of, you know, my involvement with all souls and living in a, well, not living, but being so involved in a justice based um, organization. And League of Women Voters is very um, compatible with that. That you know you do you seek to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I don't know, I'm going in circles now, but that's how I think of it. All right, uh, George. Uh, your presentation was incredibly interesting. Uh, 
I'm, I'm concerned about District 5 and that uh, there were some thoughts that uh, Cleaver uh, could be uh, booted out somehow. It, it doesn't look like that's too likely, but is there, if they're being aggressive, is it possible that they could essentially gerrymander around and cause Cleaver to have a much more challenging district? Um, absolutely. I mean, I, actually, they could do that easily. Um, you know, the shape of District 5 is pretty bizarre. And um, I mean, I, I could put it back up again, but I don't know if it's worth it. Um, because it, it's, well, I'll, I'll actually put it another way. Six is right north of us. And it's pretty bizarre, because a part of it reaches down almost to the southern end of Jackson County. Um, like kind of right in the middle, it's got this long arm that that reaches down, and um, it's um, yeah. I mean, it would be it would be very easy because um, Kansas City itself is um, you know is do doesn't well put it the other way. St. Louis is the only the only city that has a um, a minority majority and um you know in kansas city doesn't it's only like in that district it's only like 41 percent or something um black and so it, it'd be very yeah well it'd be very easy to um pull in some of the rural areas that are near around Joe has um, moved on because he's going to the in-person service. So, you know, have me uh, organizing the question askers. Evelyn, you're up next. Well, I want to, uh, I need Mary to weigh in on this, but uh, Mary, we know that it's, it's likely that the maps that the two commissions draw will go to the appellate, to the appellate court and the court will have to draw those maps. Um, we also, Mary and I know that the League of Women Voters often partners with NAACP, Common Cause, ACLU, to go to court to press for the right thing to be done. Now, Mary, I'm, I'm just not clear on what will happen once though, because we, the League and other organizations, we don't do anything to get it to the appellate court. The commissions themselves don't decide on a map and therefore the court has to decide on the map. I'm unclear, Mary, about what happens at the appellate court level. Do we, the public, get to sue the court for whatever it does? I have no clue on that. <laughs> we'll have to find that out, Mary. <laughs> I, I, mean, I'm, I, I don't know, because I, okay. I, I don't have that much contact with the state um, judges and, and know their proclivities, but I am optimistic that they are less partisan than a party would yeah. be. And so because we are going to be able to, through our testimony and through submission of all of these, not all of them, but, you know, um, a bunch of those community of interest maps, all of that will be able to be in front of the commissions, but then also in front of the judges. And, um, and you know, and the judges are going to, they don't know how to draw maps. And so they are going to be looking to um, probably some of the state of the art places that, you know, the software technology that's available. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that we will get much better maps, even better than we have now. I don't know, maybe I'm a dreamer. I'm surprised nobody asked about the poison pill. Um, okay, if I throw that question out there, Mary, what the hell did you mean by this poison pill? Um, in, uh, embedded in Amendment 3, there is a a line, and I don't have the whole line, but it refers to uh, one, no, yeah, 
one person, one vote. That's what it is. I, I had to be able to remember that. One person, one vote. And obviously we know that the way the US census works, it isn't just voters that get counted or even people who would be eligible to vote. All children, all, all residents, whether they are citizens or immigrants or whatever. And so with that term embedded in there, it is possible that they could um, only count voting age adults, adult citizens, and not count immigrants and not count children. And if that happened, well, first of all, without a doubt, there would be all kinds of lawsuits um, because you know it's just not done, and um, and it would it would really harm minorities and just cities in general because there are I assume there are more immigrants in cities than in rural areas, but that may not be completely true. Um, but I'm certain there are more children because many small towns, I mean, I grew up in Kansas, but my small town, you know, people grow up and they go away. There are not people, there are very few people there who stay and have children. So the children are in the cities and they wouldn't be counted. And um, so that's the poison pill I was talking about. And, and I don't know, I don't know what's gonna happen. Richard? Uh, yeah, thank you again for your wonderful presentation. Um, you made a comment about uh, wasted votes. Oh, yes. Um, and how with the drawing of the districts, it's changed from like 1% to as much as 15. Can you elaborate a little bit on the definition of that, please? Yeah, wasted votes. Wasted votes are um, either or both. They are like um, like if if somebody is running for office and they win in a certain district by one vote, then all they just barely win. All the votes above that are wasted votes because those votes weren't necessary for that candidate to win. And um, similarly, everybody who loses, their votes are wasted votes because they didn't result in a win. And so now I'm gonna talk about District 1 because it is the, the main district in the state that really has a problem with wasted votes. And actually, it's it's kind of been in the news of late. Um, we can talk about that too. But um, that is the one that is a majority minority. Um, I can't remember the order. It's it's a primarily black district, and and they win. Uh, a Democrat, you know, Corey Bush is the current one you know, they, they always win with somewhere between 70 and 80% of the votes in that district. And so looking at that, that, that means, I mean, it's like 20 to 30% of the votes are wasted. And, and I'm not saying that, um, that, that they should be cracked. I'm not saying that. But theoretically, at least, um, they would be better off if some of their votes were shared with District 2, which is a, um, a pretty even district. I mean, it's you know within 5% five, five of 50 in their elections. So, and, and it has been going Republican dependably. But you know, the Democrats in District 1 would benefit, so to speak, if 
some of their, you know, it's part of their district. But, um, but, but, it, but to crack it, to really make District 1 lose, would be totally against the law. I mean, that, that would be um, abridgment. And, um, but I'm not an attorney. I, I don't really know the ins and outs of that, but that is what the thing about wasted votes um, is about. And so for a, for a, um, a district to be competitive, to be, to be nonpartisan, and competitive is the best thing because then when people run, they really have to pay attention to what their constituents say. That it's not just their constituents in the primary election, they really have to pay attention to what their constituents in the general election want. And consequently, um, all over any place that that was happening, things would become less polarized because people don't have to just be pandering to the polls. They, I mean, to the polar ends, I mean. Um, does that make sense? I'm looking to the two people whose heads I can see. <laughs> yeah, yes, it does make sense, and thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, you know, it's um, 11.03, so we may have just wound down, right? Unless I mean, I can stay, but if I don't have to. Right, yeah, so I'm good with ending the recording now uh, and then letting it finish up. <laughs>